Do I do it? Do I do that? Okay. Okay. Good evening. Oh, the music is Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm happy to see you both here, lots of you online. Um, and folks might still travel in from various holiday parties that are going on across the street. If you have someone that you're waiting for in that category, the store is closed, um, but there's a sign, in 10 minutes it will be a sign on the door that says to text me here if they're there. So you can let them know that if you're waiting for someone, text the number on the door. And it's been working just fine. And then we will open up for them. Um, uh, a couple other things before I introduce Peter Brooks and Bridget Doherty. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation so much all semester. Um, so housekeeping is just that this is actually the last event of our season, and we then pause in order to um, take care of the holidays and course books and resume at the end of February. If you don't yet get our weekly emails during the event season and want to, you can leave us your email address um, on the sign-up sheet in the back. And then a quick few thank yous. The Humanities Council is a co-sponsor of this event as of many, many uh, every season, and that's a great partnership. We also had help for this night getting word out from <clears throat> lots of other people, German department, art and archaeology, European cultural studies, I, um, I'm forgetting some, but anyone who touched that, thank you so much. Um, if you're online and you want to ask a question, we hope that you do, you can just put those questions either into the chat or there's a question mark um, icon at the side of the chat, and you can click on that, and then they line up, and we will look at those and include your questions during the Q&A. So I was very sorry to see Peter go uh, when he left Princeton a few years ago after teaching here for some time and returned to New Haven, where he is Professor Emeritus uh, of Comparative Literature at Yale, and where I had met him long, long ago when I was a student. So I jumped at the chance to um, that the, his new book provided to invite him and was very happy and very happy that he agreed to make this trip. Um, better yet, this evening also then is, became a reason to ask my good friend, Bridget Doherty, um, who has co-taught lots of classes with Peter Brook um, to join and lucky for us, she too has agreed. Peter is the author of many influential books. I think we'll be talking more tonight uh, in particular about um, reading for the plot from 1984. But I'll also just mention here the melodramatic imagination, psychoanalysis and storytelling, realist vision, and troubled confessions. If you don't already, uh, you should know that Peter has also written two novels. They are World Elsewhere and The Emperor's Body. Peter and Bridges interests converge around aesthetic and psychoanalytic theory in particular. Uh, Bridget is professor of German and art and archaeology at Princeton. Um, she is a co-author of the best book on Dada that I know, uh, Dada, Zurich, Berlin, Han Hannover, New York, Paris. And she's now at work on a book on the artist Rosa Marie Trocke, uh, on her on her Warshach pictures in particular. Uh, the size of Peter's Slim new book, here it is, Seduced by Story, The Use and Abuse of Narrative, which I, uh, Peter just told me was listed 
among the 10 best books uh, by a vulture, which is New York Mag Magazine's book outfit. Um, and for good reason, it, it made that list. Uh, so it's small, but it's, uh, it's capacious. Made anxious by the narrative turn in culture, seemingly having run amok in our time, a turn which his own seminal book, Reading for the Plot, that I just mentioned, co-produced, Peter now again takes up the questions of how, through stories, we make sense of ourselves, of others, of the relation between the two, and of the world. If Nietzsche warns in the essay from which Peter's book prints its subtitle, um, that there is a kind of narration that leads to an impossibility to act, then entailed in Peter's book now is a warning that the contemporary superabundance of story <clears throat> dulls our critical and our self-critical capacities. A warning that story slides far too easily into belief systems, into myth, and that we might forget how to tell the difference. We have fictions, Peter writes, in order not to die of the forlornness of our condition in the world, as he quotes. By this, he doesn't mean, I think, that the purpose of stories is to provide simple comfort, but rather they give us the means by which to live inside our own finitude and by which to assert a measure of control over the forces that would control us. In the story Peter tells here, the use of story in teaching us to persist inside of uncertainties and, as he says somewhere, to pay suspicious attention far outstrips its abuses. And with the book, he has in turn given us some means by which we might keep the scales from tipping the other way. Please join me now in welcoming Peter and Bridget. Do you want to begin, or do well, I want to begin? Do we begin? I think, do you want to begin by reading from the okay. beginning? Um, yeah. Can you hear me without the mic? Folks okay. online won't be able to hear you. What? People online won't be able to hear you without the mic. Okay. But, yeah. All right, so I'll, I'll hold the mic. Um, I thought I would just read um, the opening uh, of the of the piece, which will give you some idea of where I'm heading. Um, as Arte said, um, I want to go publish a book called Reading for the Plot, which was sort of recording my own discovery of the importance of, of narrative and trying to think about it. Uh, so I, here I begin, there's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Nothing can stop it, no enemy can defeat it. Thus spake Tyrion in the final episode of the television series Game of Thrones, claiming the throne for Bran the Broken. Many viewers liked neither the choice of the king nor its rationale, but the claim that story brings you to world dominance seems by now so banal as common wisdom. Narrative seems to become accepted as the only form of knowledge and speech that regulates human affairs. For myself, the woman I knew narrative had taken over the world came with President George W. Bush's presentation of his cabinet in December 2000, said Bush and his appointees, each person has got their own story that is so unique, stories that really explain what America can and should be about. And more simply in presenting to Secretary, <clears throat> Secretary of State Colin Powell, a great American story, and simpler still in introduce, introducing Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta, I love his story. One had the impression that uh, Bush's understanding of reality was wholly narrative. No other form of speech or condition or, or cognitive faculty came close. Now, Bush gave dramatic confirmation to the notion that narrative is a crucial tool in the toolkit that we use to construct our knowledge of the world and our sense of self. This left me pensive and not a little confused. It was as if a fledgling I had nourished had become a predator devouring reality in the name of story. Since the early 1970s, I had been arguing and teaching that narrative is in fact to our understanding of self and surround, that we live in and by what psychologist Jerome Bruner called the narrative construction of reality. This was not at all common wisdom at the time, but rather a kind of anthropological take on narrative largely inspired by French structural linguists and anthropologists and literary theorists. With a few colleagues, I taught a course on fictions and the forms of narrative, 
that ask questions not only about the formal structures of stories, but also about their purpose and project. And not only literary narratives, but stories told in advertising uh, and myths and dreams. We saw a narrative as one of the large categories by which we try to understand the world and construct its meanings. We were seconded in this effort by what soon would be called the narrative turn in psychology and philosophy, eventually also in medicine and economics. Gradually, we learned that we were part of a larger movement to understand the uses of the narratives that surround us from the everyday to the transcendent. But we never envisioned nor hoped for the kind of takeover, narrative takeover of reality we appear to be witnessing in the early 21st century, where even public civic discourse supposedly dedicated to reasoned analysis seems to have been taken hostage. This narrative takeover, what it means, how to think about it, and how to provide a more intelligent account of what narrative is and does is what motivates me here. Well, so that, that's my opening. Thank you. Am I on now? Yeah. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for this book, which is marvelous and timely and also in many passages poignant. Um, this first paragraph, this first chapter, rather, as you've just set out, um, really hinges on a, a pair of distinctions, it seems to me. One, all under the rubric of the idea that narrative seems to have become accepted as the only form of knowledge and speech that regulates human affairs. And that we're living in a moment for which the cultural symptom is, in some ways, above all, the sort of George Bush reality, according to which what we end up with is a wholly narrative mm -hmm. understanding of reality which is di very different from what you were investigating and um, disclosing in modernism, in Freud, in Proust, um, in an earlier stage in which you're thinking of um, not so much a wholly narrative understanding of reality in which a collection of people's unique stories becomes an emblem of the diversity of America or the diversity of George Bush's America, but an awareness that reality as we experience it is narratively constructed. And one of the remarkable things about this chapter is how deftly it unpacks the, the sort of fall of an investigation into the question of how um, the reality that reality as we experience it is narratively constructed into its sort of you know, bad twin of a wholly narrative understanding of reality. And I wonder if you can gloss for us a little bit how you manage to um, drag yourself out of the fear of encountering this sort of commonplace of a wholly um, narrative understanding of reality and try to think about it in relation to um, what you had been doing from the 70s into the 80s. Um, mm -hmm in literary theory and literary critical analysis? That's a great question. I think it really was um, being bothered by this sort of mindless proliferation of stories that you get everywhere, um, which, you, which you hear, of course, uh, uh, Bush was a symptom even before him, Reagan, who I think governed by anecdote, which is a kind of miniature story, um, may, have, may have begun the phenomenon, at least in politics. But then when you look around, it's, it's everywhere. I started looking um, at uh, corporate websites, and each one of them has uh, our story. Um, and they can be very elaborate. And if you look on uh, packages of almost anything you buy, it has our story. It refers you to our story. And I began to wonder what this is all about. And then uh, I discovered a book by this uh, French sociologist named Christian Salmon. He uh, uh, traces the proliferation of story into, particularly into the military. He's very much interested in that. And things like Enron. Enron was a corporation, remember Enron, which went, went bust uh, 20 years ago in Houston, a big energy company. It was constructed uniquely on story. I mean, when, when it went bust, it turned out they had no money at all. They had no balance sheet. There was just fictions of the amazing amount of money they were going to make. So um, I began thinking about uh, the way our current reality um, 
seems to be dominated by a story. And then, of course, politics began to play into this uh, more and more um, with, the, with the Trump phenomenon and those stories and what, what made them so seductive to so many people. I mean, if you have a, a general storification of reality, um, the next step seems to be um, stories that uh, turn into myths, or even you might say into theologies that people start believing in is totally explanatory of the world. Um, and that's a phenomenon uh, that it seems to be very characteristic, of them, not only here, but in various other countries, where you just uh, cannot get out from under the mantle of the story that's been offered to you that seems so, so seductive so explanatory to so many people that even if it's completely exploded, I mean, it's it, it, going to be told a lie, you um, can't get rid of it. So I found myself when reading this book and also thinking about some of the things that I have been reading and teaching this semester, um, I was struck by your description on page 24, and I wonder if I could get you to read it of um, your early days arriving after arriving in Charlottesville from New Haven and your encounters with the monuments to Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and, and your reflections on um, Charlottesville after that. And then I... All right, all right. Um, a true story. Um, I experienced the different public stories uh, spun from disputed histories soon after I went to teach at the University of Virginia, 25 some years ago. I went to a law office in downtown Charlottesville to sign a document, and I was shocked by the massive equestrian statues of Generals Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, and another statue called Johnny Reb that dominated the court square and market square parks. As a lifetime northerner, I was ambivalent about my move to the South in the first place. At least commemorations of the leaders of rebellion made me feel I was on alien ground and unwelcome there. I could only imagine what African Americans thought of such dominant tributes to the defense of their enslavements. But these statues, as you probably know, like so many others um, across the states of the former Confederacy, had been erected in the early 20th century, not right after the war, 1917 and 1919 for the Charlottesville Chesters when the history of the lost cause had been fully rewritten and gone with a whip mode, a gallant struggle of the aristocratic agrarian South to preserve its values against the crass Northern oppressor. The statues emerged suddenly into national notoriety in the summer of 2017. The city's decision to remove them was countered by the Unite the Right rally, which brought a collection of white supremacists and other such groups to Charlottesville in what became a deadly riot an event that emblematized the Trump era deference to those who rose in opposition to contemporary demands for equality, including a new accountability <coughs> for the history of slavery. Um, just to summarize what happened later, as you probably know, in 2021, uh, the Virginia Supreme Court finally overturned the lower court ruling that the statutes must remain in place, and they were indeed hoisted off their pedestals and loaded on a flat mud flatbed trucks to be warehoused until someone thought of the proper way to display them probably in a museum. And just to add to that story, meanwhile, in 2020, the University of Virginia completed quite a stunning memorial to the 4,000 enslaved laborers who built Thomas Jefferson's academical village, a circular granite, Daniel, granite monument sunk to the earth some distance from uh, the lawn and the rotunda that are the center of the university. It's a memorial that clearly owes something to Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial, but in its own right, it's it's kind of a, a very moving, quiet repulse to those heroic uh, mounted, mounted statues of Confederate generals that once dominated in many um, southern towns, but may largely now be headed for the dustbins of history. And I, the statues are interesting as a kind of um, freezing of history, a sort of metaphors of historical narratives that get uh, cast in, in bronze and carved in granite um, uh, to 
remind us of the meanings of history. So that passage and your treatment of the 16, New York Times' 1619 project as a, a kind of history subversive of the usual, the usual tale told from the other side, and then your reflections on monuments and counter monuments put me in mind of some of the work, for example, of Sadia Hartman and um, others who reframed narration in terms of speculative historical argument and critical fabulation. And I wanted to offer you uh, a passage um, from her classic 2008 um, essay, Venus in Two Acts. And maybe think of that a little bit as a bridge to uh, a moment in your text where you ponder briefly and then turn away from the question of why it is that narrative and story seems to have fully displaced the lyric. Um, and I wonder whether there isn't something of the lyric captured in some of the some of this work. I just want to read a, a piece from Venus, a couple of quotes from Venus in two acts, um, in which Hartman sets out her ambition to tell a story predicated upon impossibility, listening for the unsaid, translating misconstrued words, and refashioning disfigured lives, and intent on achieving an impossible goal redressing the violence that produced numbers, <clears throat> ciphers, and fragments of discourse, which is as close as we come to a biography of the captive and the enslaved. And I'll, I'll read a little bit more of it, because just because it seems to capture, this seems like maybe it's one response um, that would come out of a modality of academic work slightly different from the critical, <clears throat> analytical, narratological, but related to it. And I think the, this next passage really brings that out. She asks, how can narrative embody life in words and at the same time respect what we cannot know? How does one listen for the groans and cries, the undecipherable songs, the crackle of fire in the cane fields, the laments for the dead and the shouts of victory, and then assign words to all of it? Is it possible to construct a story from the locus of impossible speech or resurrect lives from the ruins? Can beauty provide an antidote to dishonor and love a way to exhume buried cries and reanimate the dead? Or is narration its own gift and its own end, that is, all that is realizable when overcoming the past and redeeming the dead are not? And what do stories <clears throat> afford anyway? A way of living in the world in the aftermath of catastrophe and devastation? A home in the world for the mutilated and violated self? For whom, for us, or for them? So you ask early in the book why the lyric as a compact and emotionally charged form of communication has been completely eclipsed by the more discursive and additive form of narrative. And in some sense, you're also asking elsewhere in the book why epic has been so fully displaced. And I, I just wonder whether you have any thoughts on some recent work um, that might be capturing or seeking to capture elements of both the lyric and the epic, and whether that holds any promise for you. Well, I, I, I think that's right. And I think I'm not suggesting for a moment that the, the lyric is dead, or that people aren't writing poetry still. Uh, it just seems to me, in terms of public discourse, uh, this narrative paradigm has kind of taken over. And I, I just want to add, it's going back before that beautiful passage you read, um, in response to the New York Times 1619 project, you know, under Trump, something called the 1776 Project was born in the White House. And I had not read it when I wrote this book. I did recently. It's just appalling. Um, I, it's, I mean, it's been issued, it was issued by the White House, and it's just history as lies, you know, um, uh, being offered as an official version of American history. Um, slavery didn't really exist, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but that's not to answer your question. Uh, but I think it's very interesting, and I think the Charlotte's, the UVA monument is, is one of the best examples, but every university now, and I, I'm sure Princeton's included too, is looking at um, its history of enslavement. I mean, I know the, the project at Yale, which is being headed by David Blight, who's a great American um, historian and discovered things that no one really imagined that uh, 
the, the one original building still standing at Yale, uh, Connecticut Hall, which dates from 1750, was largely built by uh, slave labor. Uh, and these were domestic slaves that the sort of uh, wealthy merchants of New Haven owned. Um, and uh, so this is also this kind of telling of, of attempt to tell the history of, of this island, which is part of that same project. I can't do this with you without asking you to talk a little bit about Proust. And um, Proust in particular, in this book, um, if you would, um, with regard to the ethics of fiction and the ways in which metapsychosis and the capacity of character in Proust or in James or in great novels more broadly and modernist novels, novels in particular, provide an optic for the reader on the world that has transformative power. And there are very beautiful pages in your own prose, cheek by jowl with Proust, that I'd love to talk about. All right, well, let's see how much of this we can do. I, I got to say that um, the first chapter, which I read the opening of, <clears> is, the, is the really polemical one. And the rest of the book, I try to calm down and give more of a kind of hygiene for that of what I think uh, works and is valuable. Um, so there's this famous passage in Proust where uh, Marcel is, is reading and he's sent out by his grandmother to read in the garden because she thinks the day is, the weather's much too lovely for him to uh, stay inside. And um, he starts talking about the invention, the invention of the fictional character. and and. And pages, hundreds of pages later, this is going to lead to a kind of soaring flight of fancy where he talks about um, artists such as El Steele, who's his imaginary painter, and Dan Perry, who's his imaginary composer. The only true voyage, the only bath in the fountain of youth, would be not to visit strange lands, but to possess other eyes, to see the universe through the eyes of another, of a hundred others, to see the hundred universes through that each of them sees, that each of them is. And this we can do with an Estier and with a Van Dyke. With men like these, we do really fly from star to star. Um, and uh, so that's that's the kind of mm -hmm. lyric height of his uh, his reflection on, on reading. I'm going to go back to that scene in, in Reading in the Garden. Um, and he says, it is true uh, that the characters in the book are not what his literal minded uh, maid Francoise would call real, but all the feelings we're made to experience by the joys or the misfortunes of a real person are produced in us not only through the intermediary of an image of that joy or that misfortune. The ingeniousness of the first novel has consisted in understanding that in the apparatus of our emotions, the image being the only essential element, the simplification that would consist in purely and simply abolishing real people would be a decisive improvement. A real human being, however profoundly we sympathize with him, is in large part perceived by our senses. That is to say, remains opaque to us, presents a dead weight which our sensibility cannot lift. The novelist's happy discovery was to have the idea of replacing these parts of real persons impenetrable to the soul by an equal quantity of immaterial parts, that is to say, parts which our soul can assimilate. What does it matter thenceforth if the actions and the emotions of this new order of creatures seem to us true since we have made them ours, since it is, it is within us that they occur, that they hold within their control as we feverishly turn the pages of the book, the rapidity of our breathing and the intensity of our gaze. So um, to to read according to Proust is um, to be uh, troubled as by a dream, um, but it's more lucid than a dream. And in the couple of hours that we uh, spend reading a novel, uh, we learn what it might take us years to learn in life, or in fact that we might not learn at all because the changes in life are hidden from us by the slowness of the process. As he says, the heart changes in life, that is our worst sorrow, but we know this only in reading. So I think 
we have to draw the conclusion that for life, for Proust's life can only be understood in fiction. Living is blind. Fiction alone provides a recovery of meaning from passing time, and fictional beings are crucial to the project because their eyes allow us to see the meanings of temporal change. I think Proust prefigures Walter Benjamin's claim that we seek in fiction knowledge of the meaning of death that is foreclosed to us in our own lives. But for Proust, it's above all imagined characters that make this possible. The critic Catherine Gallagher similarly argues that the very fictionality of novelistic characters allows them to represent the real for us. It's in fact representation that matters, the heightened legibility of the fictional person, which allows us to know things that in reality we can't know. By suppressing real people, Proust's imagined first novelist extends our minds and emotions, enabling us to see the world around us in radically other ways. Once we three see through other eyes, we're transformed. It's our everyday selves that become merely virtual. I go on to talk a little bit about um, that important moment towards the middle of the, um, the search for lost time, where we encounter um, uh, the revolution of the revelation of homosexuality and how what Proust calls inversion uh, changes his whole view of society because he, he discovers that same-sex love is, is very common and creates a whole a set of parameters of society to itself. And this word inversion, which now seems to us archaic and perhaps uh, prejudicial, I think actually um, is very crucial in Proust because he is trying to invert us from our normal ways of seeing things. Um, and I think uh, Proust's large claim about the value of fictions, as I understand it, lies in the morality that may be said to adhere in the extension of a single life and consciousness into multiple diverse others. The more these others may invert us, the better. The more they unsettle our preconceptions and self-satisfactions, the better. This, to Proust, I think, represents the ethics of fictionality. The reader's relation to fictional characters is less a matter of identification, as we once lazily were taught to think, than what Proust calls metempsychosis, reincarnation in another's alien body. And it's a real metempsychosis, something we go in search of whenever we open a novel, in the act of what Henry James called immersion. But again, what this might mean needs further scrutiny if we're to understand the cognitive and ethical implications uh, of the value of fictional beings. Just two more lines. Cruz concerned with optics, with seeing the world through the eyes of another, of many others, leads him in the late pages of Time Regained, the last, the last volume of the book, to state Quote, in reality, each reader is when he reads the very reader of himself. The work of the writer is only a kind of optical instrument that he offers the reader in order to allow him to discern what, without this book, he might not have seen himself. Represented persons give us an understanding of life and of ourselves that real persons cannot. That's pretty strong. So I mean, those passages are marvelous, yours and Proust's. And I would love to hear more about how you sustain a practice as a reader and a writer today in which doing that work um, and having those pleasures actually does um, form some sort of an answer to the degradation of narrative and story and the basement of um, you know the, the kinds of relation by means of narrative communication that means so much to you because I know that your practices as a writer and a reader do form that kind of answer or even on some occasions protection from that world of the debased Narrative. You mean some contemporary novelist who? Yeah, or just even how you how you sustain that, how it um, how it continues to matter to you, ah. how you don't simply how you how it came to you to write the first chapter and pair it with the chapters on Proust. Wow, that's a tough question, uh, but a good one. Um, 
Well, I, you know, I think part of this comes from um, having taught for many years in several universities um, in departments of the humanities and knowing how beleaguered they are and how more and more beleaguered. Um, I want to insist that humanists should not um, be quiet, but should um, speak out more and, and, and make the claim, which I very much believe in, that we need uh, the kind of critical uh, reading of the world that uh, a writer like Cruz gives us, and that um, we cannot survive without that knowledge. And, and part of the claim I make at the very end of this book, after our chapter on the law, which we can talk a little bit more about, is that there is, there is a knowledge that we in the humanities have and, and a skill, a praxis, what we know how to do, which is exportable or should be exportable uh, to um, dealing with the texts uh, and the stories that are out there in the so-called real world and uh, uh, in the political world as well. And I think we're much too modest about that. So I wanted to talk about that, the final page of the final chapter, the final pages in particular, where you're talking about Supreme Court decisions and the place of um, narrative, and in some cases, self-aware gestures towards the significance of narratives that come precisely out of the humanities. Um, in one of the opinions, one of the opinions, one of the dissents, rather, by Sonia Sotomayor that you cite, in the extraordinary juxtaposition of a piece of an opinion, also a dissent, actually, by Alito with uh, a dissent by Sotomayor at the end of the book. I think we've decided that neither one of us could bear to speak about Dobbs, although we both went back and read large chunks of it over the weekend. But Peter quotes a, a dissent um, in which uh, a, a, Alito is taking issue with an opinion that was actually written by Scalia, and he has recourse to uh, an account of history that's very much in the mode of Dobbs. Um, it's quite extraordinary, maybe we won't read that, but it's followed by Peter's analysis of an extraordinary opinion of a, in a 2016 case, I believe, Utah versus, I don't remember the man's name. Right, right. Um, in which, well, Sonia Sotomayor is, is at least sending us a signal that the kinds of things that we do, not only writing the humanities, but literary writing can, can come to matter in the context of the Supreme Court opinion. That's great, Bridget. Yeah, this is a, this is a case called Utah versus Strait from 2016. And uh, the detective had staked out uh, a house in South uh, Salt Lake City on the basis of an anonymous tip that drugs were being dealt there. And the defendant, a man named Strafe, left the house after a short visit, and he was stopped by the detective. Now, this was an illegal stop because there was no uh, probable cause for stopping him, right? Uh, and he then requested Strafe's identification. Strafe produced his Utah identification card. Uh, <coughs> Officer Fackrell now relayed that information back to a police dispatcher who reported that Strife had an outstanding arrest for uh, a traffic, or an outstanding warrant for a traffic arrest. Okay, this is happening more and more, by the way. So then he arrested Strife pursuant to the warrant. And then the officer searched Strife incident incidentally to the arrest, which you're allowed to do when you have the power to arrest someone. They discovered a baggie of methamphetamine and drug um, paraphernalia. So uh, at the trial, the prosecution uh, agreed that the stop was illegal, but they um, said uh, it was attenuated uh, and the evidence should be allowed, the evidence of drugs should be allowed on the grounds of the discovery of the uh, arrest warrant for a totally different incident. So uh, this was reversed by the Utah Supreme Court, who said it violated the Fourth Amendment. But when it came to the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court reversed again and said that drug evidence was allowable in an opinion that this time was written by Clarence Thomas. Now, this story is, is retold by uh, Justice Sotomayor, who is angry. 
The court today holds that the discovery of a warrant for an unpaid parking ticket will forgive a police officer's violation of your Fourth Amendment rights. Do not be soothed by the opinion's technical language. This case allows the police to stop you on the street, demand your identification, and check for outstanding traffic warrants, even if you were doing nothing wrong. If the officer discovers a warrant for a fine you forgot to pay, courts will now excuse his illegal stop and will admit into evidence anything he happens to find by searching you after arresting you on the warrant. Because the Fourth Amendment should prohibit not permit such misconduct, I dissent. And then she, you see how she rewrites Thomas's narrative of the honest mistake uh, into something much, much more uh, sinister. And then she goes on um, and she points out that uh, arrest warrants uh, are enormously uh, uh, frequent in this country. Uh, the Department of Justice recently reported that in Ferguson, Missouri, which you may remember, and with a population of 21,000, 16,000 people have outstanding warrants against them. In Newark, New Jersey, officers stopped 52,235 pedestrians within a four year period and ran warrant checks on 39,308 of them. So the, the, the unpaid parking, ticket, parking tickets can count uh, as a warrant. By the end of her opinion, Sotomayor brings the Fourth Amendment stories into real life American communities and especially those of minority groups. And in doing so, evokes some of the most powerful narratives written about race and class. And here I'll quote again. This case involves a suspicionless stop, one in which the officer initiated this chain of events without justification. As the Justice Department notes, many innocent people are subjected to the humiliations of these unconstitutional searches. The white defendant in this case shows that anyone's dignity can be violated in this manner. But it's no secret that people of color are disproportionate victims of this time of scrutiny. See Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow. For generations, black and brown parents have given their children the talk, instructing them never to run down the street, always to keep your hands where they can be seen. Do not even think of talking back to a stranger, all out of fear of how an officer with a gun will react to them. See W.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk, James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time, It Is She Coats, Between the World and Me. By legitimizing the conduct that produces this double consciousness, this case tells everyone, white and black, guilty and innocent, that an officer can verify your legal status at any time. It says that your body is subject to invasion while courts excuse the violation of your rights. It implies that you are not a citizen of a democracy, but the subject of a carceral state just waiting to be cataloged. So you see how Sotomayor ups the ante of the story of speech to the rest, and in doing so, greatly widens what you might call the narrative circle. She makes this case speak, this one case speak to the larger American tragedy of racial, racial inequity, oppressive policing, and mass incarceration of minority <clears throat> citizens. Though she did not win the argument of Utah versus Streif, her story continues to have resonance and force well beyond the confines of the case. And perhaps someday it will be cited in a case with a more enlightened and comprehensive result. Which I have to add, not soon. <laughs> I'm tempted to just let it end with the not soon, but just yeah, um, maybe we to, open up yeah just to thank you and also um, say that you'll get even more of a reading of those incredible passages from Sonia Sotomayor in the book about the way in which her retelling of the narrative on which the Clarence Thomas opinion is based, brings it into the register of futurity. Um, it's also extraordinary to think about her command of modes of address. I mean, it's, an, it's a passage that lives up to the kind of analysis that Peter's reading brings to bear. Very, and, very eloquent. It's, and it's anger. Anger, I think, is a real problem. Well, thank you both. Can I guess? I will come around with this, and if you could speak into it so that folks online can hear your question, I have a question. Do you want to in the back right there?
Uh, fascinating. Um, at Oxford, they've taken down the uh, statue of uh, Rhodes. Uh, is it perhaps time that um, Rhodes scholarship should be stopped here and certainly renamed? Um, because, you know, it wasn't all that something like that should be. Uh, but that's one part of it. And I think you can go on to that also with Nobel and the Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel made his fortune from liberating the use of gunpowder in warfare. And yet there is a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, perhaps that should be renamed too. And uh, anyway, that's the, the, uh, the gist of that. But going along with what you said about Lee, they seem to be somewhat similar. Yeah, I mean, the, re the, the renaming um, there is, is a very vexed uh, problem. I gave a lecture at Oxford once uh, called the Zaharoff Lecture, um, which was a very formal occasion. I had to wear a rope and so on. It turned out that Zaharoff um, uh, made his money as a munitions uh, manufacturer in World War I. Uh, I think he was the original of uh, the, the guy in Major Barber, Shaw's Major Barber. Um, so I, you know, I think that has to be just taken case by case, and, and uh, Princeton has now debaptized what used to be the Woodrow Wilson School, um, and uh, uh, Yale debaptized Calhoun College. Uh, I mean, what was incredible to me there is that they ever named the college for Calhoun in the first place. You know, I mean that was in the 1930s. The college was built by the Yale Corporation. Uh, blandly went and named it for, for its distinguished alumnus, John C. Calhoun. Um, I mean, I think that the, the naming business, um, so many of those fortunes are tainted. Um, it's, it's just a, a very difficult um, issue that we're going to have to be dealing with for years to come. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very curious about the book. Um, haven't read it, obviously, so the book is a little bit in the dark, but I'm, um, I'm curious about um, how your take or your um, sort of uh, analysis of contemporary um, takeover, contemporary takeover of the narrative paradigm, how that is to be squared with this whole idea of the vanishing of the grand narrative. So, um, I mean, look, Benjamin talks about the fact that that actually materialism needs to hide um, theology because it's small and ugly. I feel like um, even the electrical materialism now is small and ugly. So it, um, this sort of grand sort of scheme of integrating history and you know, like the idea of progress is something that is one does not um, cannot address anymore without without instant sort of self critique. And then and then I wonder. If this proliferation um, and inflation of personal narrative is symptomatically related to the absence of brand narratives, is there some sort of hiding of a lack um, that is happening there? I and mean, I say this specifically, I come from Germany and applying to these American institutions, you have to write this thing, I think, called personal statement, where you write your own sort of biography and show that you just singularly be. Um, that so it has to compete against these other um, <laughs> human potential human capitals, um, and, and I found that it's like, really weird and uh, confusing. Um, so I feel like I feel like there is a sort of you know, exchangeability between these sort of narratives that you have to present yourself on the map on the bookshelf of the warehouse of identities, like you, comparable but singular, and so you need to narrate yourself. <clears throat> But the grand narrative disappears. Like, it, you see, there, there's a relation between these. Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific question, and I I do uh, touch on it a little bit. I think the notion of the of the decline of the grand narratives that Lyotard talks about in the postmodern tradition is very much uh, responsible for this proliferation of little narratives, and particularly personal narratives. I mean. Um, Lyotard sees the, the, the overriding 
narratives that we've lost as, as progress, as you say, also emancipation, right? Um, starting with the Enlightenment and with, with Kant's notion of origin um, out of childhood. People don't seem to believe in that anymore. And so you have all these little narratives and what is now being referred to as auto-fiction, um, uh, where every, every, every person is encouraged to uh, write his or her own narrative. And uh, National Public Radio, NPR, for instance, has this thing called StoryCorps, where you can go to a booth in Grand Central Station or many other places and record your story as if, as if in itself um, this had some purpose. I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is, but there's this kind of um, uh, banal notion that exchanging stories is a good thing. Um, and uh, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I don't think it's really going to get us anywhere the way those grand narratives uh, did, which sustained the whole society, right? And these, these auto-fictions don't sustain whole cultures and societies. Thank you. And then we have a question. Uh, okay. Uh, Peter, I'm, I'm enlightened by your, your understanding of the role of narrative in culture at large. Um, but as a literary scholar, I'm especially um, thankful for the way you teach me to read. Um, but I have, there's, a, there's a, a sentence in chapter two at the end that's been sticking in my mind, and I wonder if you could maybe explain it. Yet since the novel has become the overwhelmingly dominant form of our modernity, it may be valuable to keep reminding ourselves that it may not be sloppy and so on. In what way is the novel the, the overwhelmingly dominant form of our modernity? Well, I mean, if you take the long view, the, the, the novel is a relatively modern form, right, which sort of comes into its own in the 18th century. But I think by now, um, when people think of literature, I mean, granted there are still people who write and read poetry, but when they think of literature, they think of narrative fiction. And it really is um, uh, in, in any bookstore, on any lists, uh, it's what, what people are reading. And I, uh, I love the novel, and I think it's, it's capaciousness is part of our identity, right? That, um, as André Gide said, it's a lawless form. You can essentially do anything in, in, in the frame of a novel. And I think that is something that we appreciate. But I just want, I just want it to remain um, faithful to the responsibilities of that task. We have a question online and then time for one more question in the room, if there is another. Uh, so this one comes from John Kuchik. Your focus on narrative obscures its relationship to a parallel term, fiction. This matters because it's not clear what the other narrative might be, whereas the other of fiction can be more clearly be taken to be fact. Isn't it necessary for theorists of narrative troubled by the misuse of narrative in contemporary political discourse, like yourself, to find some way to mediate the narrative construction of reality with some coherent way of educating facts? How do we distinguish quote unquote true stories from false ones? Don't we need some way of understanding how reality is constructed for better or worse than simply narrative? Well, I think, yeah, that's that's certainly a, a crucial question. Um, and fact is, is all important. The, the problem is, as I see it, that we are um, usually incapable of understanding facts except in narrative form. I think that very much is characteristic of the law. The law always wants just the facts, please, and the facts on the ground. But you, you, you can't be cognizant of facts on the ground until you put them together in some coherent form, which is usually the form of a narrative. I mean, this is what the, te the detective story uh, taught us. So I don't see any um, uh, clear test that you can use except that, you know, as Hemingway says, the good writer has to have a built-in shit detector. And the good <laughs> critic has to have that too. You have to analyze stories for their plausibility and for their um, for how they are working on you. I, I think I put it back. You have to have a certain um, uh, 
acid test of narratives. And that's what's going to enable you to get to the facts. There's another question. So the way to develop that acid test, it seems, is to read and read more and read some more. Um, and this is a, a really wonderful place to start. Your book is incredibly elegant. It's a conservative term, but uh, the writing is really just beautiful. And uh, I like how often we have opened, opened it up tonight uh, in the good way to give everyone a sense of it. I invite you to uh, browse it uh, in the back. Maybe you have time to sign a few copies if someone would like that. And uh, you can just pay on your way out. But first, let's thank Peter and Bridget for this conversation.